Welcome to SibSpot. Today's episode is about malicious compliance. Our first story is by Grim Fucus 21 I'll meet the call count, but I won't make the calls count. I worked at a call center for a collection agency for nearly five years. Anybody who has worked in this type of environment knows that there's all sorts of targets that are expected to be met, be they daily, monthly, or whatever. One of our targets was to make a certain number of calls per day. I believe it was 120. Naturally, though, the more contact you would make with debtors, the less time there was to make other calls. It's usually not an issue, but some days you might make significantly more contact than others, and sometimes your call count might be like two-thirds of what it should be. We would get regular updates on the call count, and our manager would let us know if we were on track, and at the end of the day, they would give you the final results. I found it very annoying when you would have a successful day collecting debts and generating revenue for the company, only to have a manager dwell on your call count. Any protest of, yes, I didn't meet the call count requirement, but hey, look at the revenue I generated today? It doesn't matter. The target must be met. Even if it wasn't a successful day, but I knew I still ended up spending much time in contact with these debtors in an attempt to collect, I would ask my manager to review my talk time to see that my efforts were being made to do what we were hired to do. It doesn't matter. The requirement must be met. Now, to be clear, a call only counted if someone picked up or the call went to voicemail box that wasn't full. The system was unable to register events otherwise. Not in service, voicemail box full, rings out with no voicemail box or answer. Meaning, if you were to make hundreds of attempts in one day, only a fraction are registered. Everyone is aware of this, but it didn't matter to the company. Well, I was tired of the unfairness of it all. It also doesn't help that the company was grossly skimming our bonuses that my department's client provided to us as a reward for successfully collecting on these debts. It was really obvious when our bonuses became random numbers when it was only possible for them to be multiples of five. Frustrated with this literal theft and an underappreciation of successful collection, the whole point of the job, I decided to comply with the call count expectations and never be under the target again. I created a notepad file with a list of all the telephone numbers that went straight to voicemail. These are often numbers that have blocked us or presumably the owner of the number set up as away or something. From then on, I made sure to make 15 to 20 calls per hour, and that would register, implying that even more calls were being made that they just couldn't see due to the way the system registered calls. I would spread these calls out so my activity wouldn't seem suspicious and would spend all day reading articles on the internet. Naturally, the revenue I had been generating decreased by about 80%. How come you're not collecting? Well, manager... You can see I'm surpassing my call count target and my talk time is very low, so I'm just not getting the opportunities to do so. It should be noted that whatever I was collecting after doing so was really easy. These people whose accounts we received, who could only pay and wanted to pay anyway. Often, these people would call us, so I just relied on it to make it appear like I was doing anything at all. They started giving me lower value portfolios at work, which is fine by me. You are stealing my bonus the very incentive I have to do more than the bare minimum anyway for a paycheck. I honestly thought I was quiet quitting, but no, I had a reputation as a valued member of our department and company, so no one wanted to fire me. I guess they just chalked up my lack of success to the bad portfolios they were assigning me. Steal my bonuses and dwell on the target that would be better judged as a marker of effort rather than an end-all, be-all, and I couldn't care less. I was getting paid to read. This went on for nearly two years until I had to leave for mental health reasons. Our next story is by Augustus B. McPhee. Need me to stay back and cover a shift? This will cost you big time. This comes from about 15 plus years ago when I was, and still am, working with people with disabilities in a community home. It's a great job for those who like it, a terrible one for those who don't meaning that any staff you meet are either very new or long-term, like myself. As a consequence, the turnover rate of staff is high, and replacement staff are slow to be hired 
meaning you often find shifts not covered straight away. This is an industry where simply not having a shift filled isn't an option, particularly where I work in a house with a single day staff and a single night staff, each working 12 shifts on a seven day spread over two weeks. There are some strict rules regarding hours you can work, intended to avoid burnout, but more used to keep a rain over time, which in our industry paid 70% your hourly rate for the first three hours above your 76 hour fortnightly maximum and 100% for any time after that. You can't demand overtime, but if they require you to work longer, they can't not pay you overtime. Also worth noting is that the people we work with are vulnerable, meaning they cannot be left unsupervised. Long story short, you can't go home until your replacement arrives. So back in the early 2000s, we were having problems locating staff. Lots of people were working overtime and a lot of fresh faces appearing and disappearing. The house I worked in wasn't difficult in particular for adults with intellectual disability, but there was no support by which I mean the worker there had to fend for themselves. There was no supervisor in the next building. They were miles and miles away. I'd frequently at this time had to stay back half an hour, an hour waiting for staff to come replace me. I was less than happy with the way it was handled each time I called the office to tell them the night staff haven't arrived, do you know who is booked? To which I get the reply, we are still looking, how late can you stay? The obvious answer was until I'm replaced, but what I often said was I prefer not to stay after the end of my shift, but that doesn't seem to matter now, so I'll stay until someone comes. Each time a new face arrived, I'd give them all the information they needed for the shift, introduce them, walk them through their duties, etc. This would take 20 or 30 minutes. The point being is I don't just jump ship when staff arrives to replace me. This is someone's home and I like them, so I'm not going to leave them in the hands of someone uninformed. Q2 that weekend. My roster had me working 12 hour days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Come Friday night, my replacement didn't arrive. I waited. I sent a text message to the supervisor after 15 minutes, then called after 30, left a message, and when they eventually called me back, I could tell they had not found a replacement. I told them I'd stay until they did. This was by that time, an hour after I was meant to finish, 10 p.m. Come 11, they call and they say they simply can't find a replacement. They offer a deal and say if I stay and do the night shift, I can take the next shift off. It's pretty even so you won't miss out, they said. Then they changed their tone and said, it's not really a request, we have no other option. Treat this as a direction. I reminded them that it was a passive house, meaning you got half the hourly rate from midnight, but you could sleep in the bed provided, so I'd actually be taking a pay cut. They didn't know what else they could do, so I made a suggestion. I'd stay and do the night shift, but I wasn't going to give up my next shift. I was going to do that one as well. They agreed. It meant they didn't need to find a replacement for me in the morning, so they thought it was a good deal for them. It was, however, an even better deal for me. It took a few emails over the weekend with the union to sort out the particulars, but what happened was this. Once I couldn't leave my work site because of lack of a replacement, I was on overtime. As this overtime was because of a direction, not voluntary, it remained in place until I went home. Because I didn't agree to drop my following day shift, my overtime continued till I ended on Saturday night. The upshot being that working 36 hours in a row resulted in the equivalent of 60 hours of pay. I was the first person to, as they say, pull this stunt. And word got around that if you didn't get replaced, you were actually the person who was in a position of power. It didn't take long until the department put in a little more effort into training and employing extra staff, so something like this never happened again. Not at least to me. I love seeing stories like this where people get paid a large amount of money for work. Like they shouldn't have to work 36 hours in a row. And because he did... He made bank. He got a full week's pay in one weekend, basically. Even more than a week's pay for most people. He got 60 hours of pay. That's epic. You could, like, go and buy a graphics card with that. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's probably what I do with mine, honestly. Today's episode has come to a close. Until we meet again, have a thrilling day.